Working Group and the Professional Women's Network of Lincoln Laboratory. Before we begin the program, I would like to take a moment to thank several people who worked very hard to make sure that this event would be a success. First and foremost, I would like to thank Jerry Durant, who, whose idea it was to originally invite the speaker, and if not for her perseverance, this would never take place. And for the time and effort that was required over the last couple of weeks to attend to the myriad of details, I would also like to thank Shira Byron, Lisa Plimpton, and Leslie Weiner. It would be safe to say that this morning's speaker requires no introduction, uh, as testified by the fact that so many of you are here. And in fact, on the way over, I was admonished to, uh, by her to uh, keep my remarks to a minimum. So what I would like, what I would like to uh, share with you is a, is a story which I think typifies the, the essence of her career. Many years ago, <laughs> so we agreed on. <laughs> One sentence. Well, if I can get the sentence correct. Um, the sentence is that um, Commodore Grace Murray Hopper was the third programmer of the first large-scale digital computer, and she's been coping in the United States. In the United States thank you. <laughs> and she's been coping with it ever since. Um, with them ever since. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure that I present Commodore Grace Murray Hopper. There's a particular reason why I like that introduction. It's because it enables me to remind you all that the first large-scale digital computer in the United States was a Navy computer operated by a Navy crew during World War II. And lately I've been finding I had to remind people of that. Because there's been a tendency on the part of a certain junior service <laughs> to try and claim credit for those early computers. And of course, they didn't even exist yet. So I just want you to remember that it was a Navy computer. And if you're wondering why I kept my cap on this long, I had a reason for that, too. It's because, of course, this is my identifier. I hope you're all well aware that every record you put in a computer must have an identifier. That's so you know where to put it and how to get it again. On the other hand, that identifier has to be understood both by the person who originally puts it on the record and also by the person who later looks at the record. And that's where I've been having problems lately with my identifier. Because I go wandering around airports and people come up to me and say, when's the next plane leave for Houston? <laughs> I got totally demoted one night in San Francisco. I got off an elevator and there was a couple in the elevator with me. And as I got off, I heard the woman say to her husband, what was that? And he said that was a security guard. <laughs> so then I went to Canada to speak at the University of Guelph, and I had to go through immigration at the Toronto airport. And I handed my passport to the immigration officer, and he looked at it and looked at me and said, what are you? And I said, United States Navy. He took a second real hard look at me, and then he said, you must be the oldest one they've got. <laughs> Boy, I didn't think that was the way to welcome visitors to Canada. <laughs> but the only put me down I could think of was to say, no, Admiral Rickover was six years older. I don't think he even knew who Admiral Rickover was. <laughs> but as long as you all know what I am, I'll take my cap off. That only goes to show my white hair. Now, I can remember when Riverside Drive along the Hudson River in New York City was a dirt road. And on Sunday afternoons, as a family, we'd go out and sit on the drive and watch all the beautiful horses and carriages go by. And a whole afternoon, there might be one car. Cars were enormously expensive, individually built, those big old Rios and Packards. No such things as gas stations. If you went on a long trip, you put fried gallon cans of gasoline on the back deck and took it with you. No such thing as garages. 
If you broke down the middle of Utah, you wired manufacturer, and he sent a man with a part, and then he worked on the part till it fitted your car. <laughs> then along came a gentleman named Henry Ford with two concepts, standard interchangeable parts and an assembly line, and he started to build Model Ts. And I think we've forgotten how they totally transformed the world of transportation. You could have any color you wanted as long as it was black. They cost between $300 and $600, and people started to own cars. Well, since people owned cars, they demanded roads. We blacktopped the dirt roads. We built concrete roads. Gas stations appeared. Garages could stock the interchangeable parts. People found they could move to suburbs and drive to work. Then we had to build shopping centers. We did a pretty good job of all that, managing all of that. Yet we totally neglected the underlying thing, which was transportation as a whole. The net result is that today, the railroads are falling apart when we need them. The Army Transportation Corps tells me that they're going to have to build some special carriers to move the tanks from the center of the country to the ports to ship them overseas, because the flat cars have all disappeared. If we wanted to move coal to replace oil, we probably couldn't do that either, because there are not enough hopper cars to move both the coal and the grain crop. And the truth of the matter is, we totally fail to look at transportation as a whole. Now, whether you recognize it or not, the Model Ts of the computer industry are here. We've been through the preliminaries of the industry. We're now at the real beginning of what will be the largest industry in the United States. And I'm very much afraid we'll make the same mistake over again. I'm afraid we'll continue to go out and buy beautiful pieces of hardware with blinking lights, convoluted software, and totally neglect the underlying thing, which is the total flow of information to any organization, activity, company, or what have you. We have neglected looking at that information flow. And it'll make a tremendous difference in how we design our systems of the future. I find myself repeatedly using that word system. Uh, of course, I didn't know anything about systems till after World War II. Before World War II, I might have a sick stomach, but after World War II, it turned out I had a malfunctioning gastrointestinal system. <laughs> Everything turned out to be a system, and I think we have forgotten to look at our system. We've forgotten that we're dealing with a raw material called data. We're feeding it to a process, just like any manufacturing process, which consists of hardware, software, communications, and people. Hopefully, the output product is information. Equally, hopefully, this process is under some form of control, and there's a feedback loop from the information to control to improve the quality of the information. We spent the last 40 years talking about the process. We've had endless seminars, publications. We've gone on and on about the hardware and software. We've never taken time to look critically at the raw material, data, and the output product, the information. And it's time, time we began to do it. We've also failed to notice something else. That information that's put out is absolutely inert. It never does anything. It's a printed page, something you see on a computer screen, you hear it over the telephone, but information by itself never does anything. It still has to be fed to another process, which consists of a human being who absorbs that data and turns it into something that we might call knowledge or intelligence. This process, of course, has to be under some control, and there's a feedback loop here to improve the quality of the knowledge and the intelligence. We're swamping this guy. We're pouring tons and tons and tons of information, and he must have some help for getting through that information. The um, chairman of the computer science department at Annapolis cited a case. We're going to put people in command of ships with 100 or more computers on board. There must be some way of helping him get through that mass of information so that he can make decisions. And this is where we're going to need some form of expert routines. It's true not only of that ship, it's true of any company president, anybody trying to make decisions. We've got to give them some assistance in getting through those tremendous masses of data that we're throwing at them. We also got to go back and look critically at this data. Oh, and of course, there have to be some liaison between these two people. I suppose that means there'll be an admiral or a general up there, but uh, I could do without that. I think they could talk to each other. 
we've got to begin to look at that raw material. One outfit did something about it. It was the Coast Guard. They had a system which contained the complete history of every buoy. When the maintenance crews went out to check the buoys each year, they looked in to see what had been done about the buoy in the last couple of years and whether any message had been left the previous time to check something next time. Well, those records had started years ago as a punch card, and they'd gotten longer and longer and longer and longer and longer. And they were on slowing down the whole online system. So they took a second look, and they chopped the records. The last two years are online for direct reference by the maintenance people. Most of it's going back to microfilm. Because the only time they need it is when they're going to get a new boy and they need to know when they bought the old one, how much they paid for it, or in case Congress has a question. They actually looked at the value of the data they were processing. And this is something we're going to have to do as we move into the future. We've got to go beyond just the hardware and software. We've got to look at the raw material, the data, and the output product, the information, and look at it very critically. We haven't been doing it. I looked at one system, and I found an absolutely stray report in there. It was really an interim report. And I said, how did that get there? Oh, it's a congressional, implying that you couldn't touch it. And it turned out that about 17 years ago, some congressman had asked a question. I said, stop sending it and see what happens. We've got to clean out our systems, and it's something we fail to do. And we've got to come back to that basic concept of the information flow. Two years ago, in computer world, there was an article. Information as a corporate asset pointed out that information has an actual value and that it is a company asset. And someday soon, it's going to appear on the company balance sheet. And in most cases, the information itself was far more valuable than the hardware and software that were processing it. And it's something we've got to recognize. Most of the large corporations are now insuring their databases against loss, illegal access, and so on and so forth. Information is an asset. Of course, I had a very good time with that because I had to go over and speak to the IRS. Now, as far as I'm concerned, it's always fair to bait the IRS. <laughs> so um, I inserted the question, which they have not yet answered. How do you depreciate the value of information? <laughs> Isn't that a honey? Some of it's good overnight, some of it lasts 100 years. I think that's going to be wonderful. And I hope they get a real good headache out of that. <laughs> Something we've totally failed to look at. We have failed to look at the value of the data we are processing. Now, some people even ask questions. They said there's no difference in the value of information. Well, I know a chemical plant that's operated by computer. The information comes in from marketing, goes to the computer, it opens valves, pushes stuff through pipes, tells inventory what it's made. The people are paid by the computer. Nice computerized reports go up to the president's desk. Let's suppose that two pieces of data simultaneously enter that system. One comes from a valve out in the plant and says, if you don't open me, the plant's going to blow up. You have less than a minute in which to act, 100 lives at stake, $100 million chemical plant. At the very same instant, another part of the system comes the fact that Joe did two hours of overtime, which is the more valuable piece of information. And what are our criteria? I suggested three. The time in which you have to act, the number of lives at stake, the number of dollars at stake, I think there's a four. The importance of that piece of data in making decisions. We have yet to define the criteria for the value of information. There's no article, no paper, and it's high time people began to look at it because it will make a difference in how we design our systems of the future because we must give priority to the most valuable information. We've got a lot to do in these areas largely coming from the fact that we fail to look at our raw material and our output product. Of course, another thing we've done is assume that everything that came off a computer was correct. I made awful good use of that one year. I sent my budget through and it was beautiful, beautifully printed, lovely diagrams, everything. It got turned down. I took it back and shoved it through the computer and got a computer print out and it went through with flying colors. Because it came off the computer, it was obviously correct. <laughs> We've long assumed that. This up, very much upset Lieutenant, then Major Rendlin. He retired two years later as a colonel down at Maxwell Air Force Base. He found a section of the privacy law, which applies to military and to civilian employees of the government. It says if you have incorrect information in a personnel file, 
And if because of it someone's denied a raise or a promotion or something, they have a right to sue the federal government. So we decided to find out how much it might cost to have incorrect information in a personnel file. And he said, let's suppose I have a file on 8,000 people. Not unusual on an air base. Then he said, let's suppose that I know that that file is 95% correct. Me, I don't believe there's a personnel file anywhere in the country that's 95% correct. <laughs> but he said, let's suppose it is. Then 5% of those records contain incorrect information. 400 of them contain incorrect information. Then he went and talked to the personnel types and the psychologists and all of those people and said, what's going to be the effect of the incorrect information? They said, well, it'll stick out. It won't match the rest of the file. And nobody takes any chances on anybody nowadays. We think in 90% of those cases, the incorrect information will cause a negative decision. That would mean in 360 cases, a negative decision is taken on incorrect information. Then he said, we don't know how many of those people will sue. Most of them have found this paragraph in the privacy law. In fact, we have no information. Therefore, by the laws of probability, we have to say the chances are 50-50. 180 of them sued the government. Now, since the incorrect information is in the file, they're bound to win their suit. He said, let's suppose the damages are $2,000, $100 for court costs, $650 for lawyers. Each case is going to cost us $2,750. How much do we stand to lose in a 95% correct file? Well, 180 times $2,750 is almost half a million dollars. $490,000. And to make that computation, there's no way you can go to the boss and say, give me $200,000 to correct that file, and I'll save you money. We have totally failed to look at the costs of incorrect data in our systems, and it's something else we've got to begin to look at as we look at the raw material and the output product. There are a lot of things like this that are driving me toward the future. I thought you might like to know that the first computer bug is still in existence. <laughs> we were building Mark II the summer of 1945. It was hot in Cambridge. Naturally, since it was World War II, we were working in a World War I temporary building. <laughs> <laughs> no air conditioning, screens weren't very good, windows were open, and Mark II stopped. Now, Mark II was built out of relays in an awful rush during the war for ordnance computations. Incidentally, her design is still unique. Nobody's ever built one like it. She could, under program control, she could be operated as all one computer, two independent computers that com communicated through transfer registers or master and a slave. It was a very nice concept and should be looked at again for some of our new things. However, Mark II stopped. We finally located the failing relay, and inside the relay, beaten to death by the relay contacts, was a moth about this big. So the operator got a pair of tweezers and very carefully fished the moth out of the relay, put it in the logbook, put scotch tape over it, and below it he wrote, first actual bug found. <laughs> I thought you'd like to know the bug is still in the logbook under the scotch tape, and it's in the museum at the Naval Surface Weapons Center at Dahlgren, Virginia. So if you drive down past Dahlgren someday, you can stop by and see the first bug. And of course, I think it's marvelous that the Navy's keeping some of the early artifacts like the first bug and me and a few other things. <laughs> However, it finally got to be 1946 and the war was over. And each one of us had to decide what we were going to do next. Now, up to then, the waves had all been reservists. I would remind you that though the Navy was the last to accept women, when they did, they took us all the way in. We were never an auxiliary. And in 46, they offered us all the opportunity to transfer to the regular Navy. So naturally, I applied for transfer to regular Navy. And I was turned down because I was too old. The cutoff age was 38, and I was 40. However, I elected to remain in the reserves. Now, back in those days, we had three jobs to do, summer training duty, weekly meetings, and take correspondence courses. We had to take correspondence courses according to our designators. I was then designated ordnance. I learned all about big guns and gun turrets until I ran out of ordnance courses. And the only other courses that would credit for my designator were the War College courses. So absolutely terrified, I sent for the first course, and they sent me the first problem. I was to fuel a task force at sea in minimum time. And all they told me was how fast the different ships could pump oil and receive oil. And of course, I knew nothing about fueling ships at sea. But I had to do something, 
So I lined up an oiler and a carrier and started pumping from the oiler to the carrier. Clearly wasn't going to get me minimum time. I decided they must have given me the rates for some reason, so I looked at them again and found I could simultaneously pump oiler to carrier and carrier to destroyer. And they'd both be filling up because the rates were different. And somewhere along the line, somebody had given me a course in problem solving. And they told me to always extend every solution. So I did. I started pumping from a destroyer to a Corvette. It was all going nice. <laughs> but that course had also told me to generalize every solution. So I did. On the other side of the order, I pulled up a cruiser and a destroyer and a Corvette. And I ended up with half the task force, all hitched up with lines, sailing down the middle of the ocean. <laughs> My problem was returned to me with a comment, an interesting solution. <laughs> I decided that wasn't the way you fuel ships at sea. Along came the next one. They gave me a squadron of submarines. Scout the Caribbean, minimum time. Well, I knew less about submarines than I did about oilers. So this time I called on my friendly computer to help me, and I used a random walk program for each of the submarines. And boy, did I cover that map in minimum time. Only trouble was I had those submarines cutting across each other. They made U-turns, one little circle up here, and came back in a, an interesting solution. <laughs> and I was sure I was going to flunk when along came the third problem. And that's the one I want you to remember. I was to make a plan to take an island. <coughs> then after I completed my plan, I was to make two reviews of it. I was to review my plan in the light of all possible enemy actions, all possible future events. Then I was to review the cost of not carrying out the plan. We made those reviews, the cost of not doing something. Again and again, I find that left off our plans. You'd be amazed how many times the cost of not doing something is enough greater than the cost of doing it, so it's what will get you the budget. We made that review for every island. We looked at the cost and men and material of taking an island. Then we looked at the consequences of bypassing that island. And some islands we took, Saipan, Tinian, others we bypassed, like Truk. But that study was always made. What is the cost of not doing it? A good example related to computers, I've long advocated sticking to the standard high-level languages, because this tremendously reduces the cost of conversion when you go to the next piece of equipment. But I couldn't make people understand this. So I finally looked around Washington to see which agency in Washington scared people most. And I decided it was the General Accounting Office. Because look, they look at everything you're doing and go tell Congress about it. So I went over to GAO and said, do you realize how much money we're losing by not sticking to the standards? And they said no. And they made a year-long year study. Their answer was that over the next five years, about 8,500 of the general management computers in the total federal inventory would be replaced. And the cost of conversion was running $450 million a year down the drain, simply because we'd failed to enforce the standards. And there was a case where we had not looked at the cost of not doing something. All possible enemy actions, all possible future events. I keep finding computer installation that base their plans on the things they're doing now and the equipment they have in-house. And failing to review that equipment in the light of what they will be doing and the equipment that will be available. Probably the most dangerous phrase you could ever use in any computer installation is that dreadful one. But we've always done it that way. That's a forbidden phrase in my office. To counteract it, I keep a clock which operates entirely counterclockwise. <laughs> the first day people meet it, they can't tell time. But the second day, they discover what used to be 10 hours is now 10 after, and they can tell time again. Normally, it's not till the third day that they realize there was never any reason why clocks had to run clockwise. They could just as well have run counterclockwise. The hands don't have to go by the digits. I have another clock that has a pointer and the digits go around on a drum. So it's perfectly good time. Because by now I have a digital clock and my very helpful crew gave me an hourglass. <laughs> and, uh, they sit there day in and day out and say, never, never, never in this office say, but we've always done it that way. So I'd like to give each one of you a very small gift. I'll promise you something. If during the next 12 months, any one of you says, but we've always done it that way, 
I will instantly materialize beside you and I will haunt you for 24 hours and see if I can get you to take another look. We can no longer afford that phrase. It's a dangerous one. And we've got to move toward that future. I had to give a presentation for the EDP Policy Committee, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, all admirals and generals. I had to remind those gentlemen that they'd had tremendously thick reports on their desks that they'd had to absorb, major decisions to make. They had not had time to keep up with a technology that was changing overnight. And therefore, they were going to have to learn to listen to their juniors. We're all going to learn it. My two-year-old, not quite two-year-old, grandnephew uses a commuter. The commuter says D. John looks at the keyboard and he hits D. And a big D comes up on the screen and then it cheers himself, D, 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 D. The computer says, yeah, S. He looks, S. And he knows the whole alphabet and all the uh, digits and he's perfectly familiar with the keyboard. I have some sympathy with his kindergarten teacher a few years from now, because I think he's going to be even better at it. We've got to move to the future. I've been watching it happen in the Navy with the greatest of glee. There was young, one young Lieutenant Junior Grade, he was ordered to a very small ship. The Navy thought it was too small to have a computer for admin, so he took his own computer on board. He very quickly got all the files in his computer, getting all the reports out on time, doing a perfectly marvelous job. When he was transferred, the captain had to buy his computer because the ship wouldn't run without it anymore. <laughs> then there was the case of a young commander of a squadron. He was told to take his squadron out to an aircraft carrier. He found that when he did, he'd have to leave the maintenance records of his planes ashore in the local naval air rework facility. This didn't suit him at all. He wanted his maintenance records with him. So he went out and bought an apple. And then he went over to the NARF and made friends with an ensign and a DP. A DP is a programmer. And he liberated, borrowed, stole his maintenance records out of the NARF and into his apple. He got a case for it and put in the space behind his seat and flew off to the carrier with all of his maintenance records and a computer with which to update them. It was highly successful. So he came back and told about it at the Department of Defense Computer Institute. And somebody looked at him and said, are you supposed to do that? And he said, I didn't ask. That brings me to the most important piece of advice that I can give to any of you. If it's a good idea, go ahead and do it. It is much easier to apologize than it is to get permission. <laughs> That goes particularly to our young people, and in case you're afraid of the risks, I'll even loan you one of the Navy mottos. A ship in port is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. And I want you all to be good ships and sail out to sea and do the new things. And then, of course, when they catch up with you, oh, gee, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do that, but any party, look how it works. <laughs> and you'll win every time. We've got to move in that future. And we've got to listen to everybody and got to go ahead and do things without waiting a long period of time it takes to make decisions. And that's true not alone in government, but also in industry and everywhere. We've got to go ahead and do these things and move to the future. There was another case of a young electronics technician, first class, out in the Pacific Fleet. He built a computer aboard ship. Well, the PR man of his ship thought this was absolutely out of this world, so he took a picture of the sailor and his computer, and he put it in Navy Times. Well, Admiral Peter Collins saw it. So he decided to write a letter to the sailor and congratulate him. And knowing how long a Navy letter would take to get from Washington out to a ship in the Pacific Fleet, he put a stamp on it, sent it direct, by U.S. mail. <laughs> well, the sailor decided if the Admiral could write him direct, he could write the Admiral direct. And he did. And he thanked the Admiral for his letter, he pointed out he didn't know Admiral's read Navy Times, but he'd be sure glad they did. He then went on for 10 pages, single-spaced, and told the Admiral in complete detail exactly what was wrong with the computers on board ship and what ought to be done about it. Probably the best survey we'd ever seen. So the Admiral reached out his hand and said, ET-1 Slater, Pacific Fleet to Norfolk. He gave him three more ETs and some DPs and a small amount of money and told him to build a computer. In four months, they put it together out of off-the-shelf components, beautiful micro with database and everything. 
So they set him up as a microcomputer evaluation group at the Naval Regional Data Center, Norfolk. And they started liberating, otherwise acquiring hardware and software. Pretty soon they knew an awful lot about microcomputers. So they decided that part of their job must be to share this information with the rest of the Navy. And it would be a fine idea to put on a seminar. Now, I don't know whether you know what it takes to put on a seminar in the Navy. You have to go all the way to the top of the Navy to get permission and money and back down again. That can take you a year. They ignored all of that. For their own funds, they put a down payment on the local hall. Then they called all the manufacturers of microcomputers and said, for 200 bucks, we'll let you exhibit your equipment, and you better be there. They sort of implied the Navy wouldn't buy the stuff otherwise, but they didn't say that because that would be illegal. They thought they might get 100 people. They got, had to cut it off at 300. That's all they had room for. A year later, they rented out, they got some space out of Naval Postgraduate School and ran it on the West Coast. This time, they thought they might get 500. They had to cut it off at 800. A year ago, they ran it in Virginia Beach, the third one, Navy Micro 84. The Admiral introduced it. And next month will come Navy Micro 85, fully approved, and the Admiral will open it. Beautiful program, everything about microcomputers, hardware, software, and everything else, and how they're going to be used in the Navy. All started by a bunch of sailors who decided they'd better inform the Navy about microcomputers. They went one step further. Even after the seminar, they really felt they weren't reaching all the people in the Navy they should reach to tell them about microcomputers. So it'd be a fine idea to start a magazine. Now, if you think starting a seminar is rough, try and start a magazine in the Navy. You have to go all the way to the top of the Navy, all the way to the top of the Department of Defense, and then all the way to the top of the Federal Office of Personnel Management and back down again to get permission and money. They didn't bother with any of that. They did do one thing legally. <laughs> they got permission from Nabisco to use the title of their magazine. And their magazine is Chips Ahoy. <laughs> And it is a top-notch magazine on microcomputers. They review the new equipment, the new software, they run a library of routines, and they're doing a marvelous job of keeping the Navy informed about microcomputers. And one nice thing that happened was this January disappeared in the magazine. The Secretary of the Navy has determined that this publication is necessary in the transaction of business required by law of the Department of the Navy. Funds for printing of this publication have been approved by the Navy Publications and Printing Policy Committee four years later. If they hadn't started it, we wouldn't have it yet. They put the Navy ahead by going ahead and doing things. And you should try and get a subscription to it. It's quite worth reading. But something else was happening to us. We found that our senior people didn't understand about microcomputers. In fact, the captain of one ship wrote a letter to the admiral, and he said, do something. They're all over my ship. <laughs> and it sounded as if he had rats or cockroaches or like that. What had happened was he'd been invaded by microcomputers. Slater, by now, was a chief, and he wrote a paper. Everything I ever wanted to know about microcomputers and didn't know who to ask, and he wrote it in plain English so that our senior people can understand it. And I would urge all of you, please, to write more stuff in plain English so we can feed it to admirals and generals and people like that. They don't understand computerese. They need plain English. And we've got to convert them one way or another. And that's been very successful. Well, about then, the Navy and Air Force made a contract with Zenith for 10,000 microcomputers. The first were the Zenith 100s, then the 120s, now the 150s, which are Tempest tested. 40 or 50,000 of them have gone out into the Navy and the Air Force. And it became quite clear we had to have a set of courses. So they decided to run a school. And they now run microcomputer education at Nardak, Norfolk. Most of the courses are two or one or three days. And they give courses on introduction to microcomputers, introduction to data communications, Zenith 120 hardware, MSDOS, CDOS, PeachText, PeachCalc, WordStar, Multimate, 
Introduction to DBase 2 for the user, DBase 2 for the programmer, Condor 3, Lotus 1-2-3, Draft Talk, C language, Unix for managers, and Unix for the users. And they're doing a bang-up job of educating the Navy in the world of microcomputers. Well, now, of course, along with all of this, they were industrially funded, which meant they had to earn their way. So they decided they'd better have a sales brochure. And I swear this could have been written in Madison Avenue. The only thing that disappointed them was that they couldn't get it printed in color. Step into the future with Nardak Norfolk, your microcomputer specialist. Microcomputer services with your future in mind. Micro exploration, consultation, technical assistance, software development, training, and so on. And they put out their sales brochure for their services in the area of microcomputers. Slater comp made chief, completed his time at Norfolk, and he was ordered to sea on the Nassau. Now clearly Slater's an unhappy sailor unless he has a computer. Well, he got aboard the Nassau, and the supply people wouldn't let him use their computer because he might order something. <laughs> Weapon system? No, he might fire a missile. Navigation? No, he'd get the ship off course, and he was very frustrated. He had to figure some way of getting a computer aboard ship that he could use. He found there was a vacancy on the Recreation Committee and they had some money. So he got himself elected to the Recreation Committee. He then produced a program. When it hit Washington, it was signed by 112 of his shipmates. And the only thing we could say was, why the hell didn't we think of that? His proposal was computer literacy at sea. It was to put computers aboard every ship in the Navy that were not part of the ship's equipment so that everybody in the Navy could start to let, learn computers because they were going to have to know it sooner or later. And I'm very glad to report there are now six computers aboard the Nassau which are not a part of the ship's equipment, which everybody on board can use to practice and learn computers. One of the nicest things that happened about five months ago was my privilege to swear Slater in as an ensign in the United States Navy. He had offers from industry that were double what he'll ever make as an ensign or a JG. He elected to stay in the Navy because they'd given him the opportunity to do the things he wanted to do and because he'd always wanted to be a naval officer. And one of the nicest things about that ceremony was that Rear Admiral Peter Collins came back to be present at it. Now something very important happened there. When I left midshipman school, they told me I'd have one job to do. That was provide leadership. And that leadership was a two-way street, loyalty up and loyalty down. Respect for your superior, keep him informed, make suggestions. Superior, take care of your crew. And the old tradition worked. There was a sailor who read a letter to an admiral, and an admiral who read the letter, all of which put the Navy way ahead in microcomputers. The old system worked, and worked very, very well. Slater, however, has now developed a new problem. He called me from out in Alameda, and he tells me it's much more difficult to get things done when you're an officer than when you're an enlisted man. <laughs> so I told him there's one sol solution to that. He'd better get himself a good chief. <laughs> but those are the youngsters that are moving us into the future in the Navy, the bright youngsters, the young officers, young enlisted personnel are the ones that are moving us toward the future. And they're going ahead and doing it. And it's the only answer, because it takes too long to get permission. Well, there were some other things that were driving me toward the future. I'll have, you probably all know this perfectly well, but I'd like to run over it again, if you don't mind. When I met Mark I on the 2nd of July, 1944, Mark I was 51 feet long, 8 feet high, 8 feet deep. She had 72 storage locations each of which consisted of 23 decimal digits in an algebraic sign. And what's more, she could do three additions every single second. Three times she could, a second she could get two quantities, add them together, and put the answer back. Sounds absolutely pitiful today. But we'll always have to remember it, because she was the first big machine man built that assisted the power of his brain instead of the strength of his arm. It took her 333 milliseconds to do an addition. We didn't stop there. The Navy built a lot of computers during the war. Zephyr, Typhoon, Hurricane, Whirlwind. Whirlwind was built at MIT. You may remember hearing of her. 
She was the first real-time computer. She was the prototype of the SAGE computers, the great big air defense computers, you know, concrete block house just filled with computer equipment. You know what the Air Force is doing with the SAGE right now? They're taking it apart, little piece by little piece. Because today, the gold in the SAGE computer is worth more than they originally paid for the computer. The only thing I haven't been able to find out is what the Air Force is doing with the gold. <laughs> I think they're hiding it somewhere. <laughs> Not till after the war was over could you go out and buy a commercial electronic computer. Not till 1951, when out came old Univac 1, the first commercial electronic computer. And it did a complete edition in 282 microseconds. And we were going a thousand times faster. We didn't stop there. By 1964, out came the first of the CDC 6400s, did a complete edition in 300 nanoseconds. Another thousand times faster. Well, now the question comes up, if you're not about the future, try to write the next line. 19 question mark. Well, we need an XYZ system that adds in 300 picoseconds, another thousand times faster? Answer is we need it right now. But we ain't gonna build it the way we've been building our computers. We're gonna have to do something different. First of all, why do we need it? I think of two problems for which we need it. The population of the world is increasing. We've got to increase food supplies. And the biggest assist we could give would be long-term weather forecasts. Yet we do not today have a computer which will run a full-scale model of the big heat engine which consists of the atmosphere and the ocean. We can only run over limited areas, limited time. We don't even know or try to test it all of our models. And it should be a, a national effort to build that computer. There's another problem coming right in this country that most people don't worry about. I ran into it because my sister lives in northern New Jersey. They had a water shortage and they were limited to 50 gallons of water a piece a day. And they came around and looked at the water meters and find people that used more than that. Down in Norfolk, they ran short of water, the city of Norfolk. Now they draw their water from wells. So they decided they'd better drill a couple more wells and they got awful cagey. They drilled them in the corner of the naval base, thought they'd get away with it. But the two new wells were in Suffolk County. So now Suffolk County is suing Norfolk County for stealing their groundwater. Down in Florida, they drew so much water out of the underlying aquifers that they opened sinkholes and dumped houses and cars into them. In Tucson, they've drawn so much out of the aquifer that the city's sinking, so every so often it cracks open in 400-yard-long cracks. In Colorado, the eastern half of the state's dry, the western half has water. So naturally, the people in the eastern half think it'd be a ducky idea to poke a tunnel through the Rockies and get water from the western half. No way are the people in the western half going to give their water to those nasty old people in the eastern half. And it's all on the courts. California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, West Texas. Who can draw how much water from which river and which aquifer? It's getting worse than that. The state of Missouri is suing the state of South Dakota because South Dakota was going to sell Missouri River water for slurry pipeline. And Missouri thinks they ought to let it come on downriver. I don't know whether you happen to see this. It came out of the Washington papers. The eight Great Lakes states and the two provinces of Canada have formed a compact, compact, a consortium. And they are not going to sell the Great Lakes water to those nasty old people down in the southwest who stole jobs and stuff. They're going to limit the distribution of the Great Lakes water. This is serious. We're going to have state against state. We're going to have to manage that water. Of course, the prize one, it's funny. I shouldn't say it's funny because it was serious. Do you realize that the sovereign state of New York sued Exxon for $16 million because Exxon stole tankers full of Hudson River water and took them down to Aruba and sold them? Can you imagine stealing Hudson River water? You ever seen that stuff? <laughs> Exxon paid New York State $5 million for the Hudson River water they'd stolen. We're going to have to manage water. Can you imagine the engineering job, the pipelines, the reservoirs, and then the computer system that will ensure that every resident of the United States gets his fair share of pure water? That's going to be one of the biggest jobs we've ever tackled, and it's going to be full of 
states' rights, laws, federal, and what have you. And we're not even worrying about it yet. So the Corps of Engineers tells me that by the end of the century, those pipelines from Canada may no longer bring oil. They may bring fresh water from the ice and snow of northern Canada. Just think of the computer power it will take to manage that. And I said we're going to have some trouble getting there. I'll tell you, remind you of something you know perfectly well. When I met Mark 1, they told me it was adding in 300 milliseconds. And I said, what's a millisecond? They very helpfully told me it was a thousandth of a second. Now, I could look a clock and see a, and see a second, but darned if I could see a thousandth of it. So I said, please show me a millisecond. And nobody would show me a millisecond. No way would anybody show me a millisecond. It was very discouraging. Pretty soon over in the engineering building, they started talking about circuits that acted in microsecond. Or they looked at one of my programs and said I wasted five microseconds. So I said, what's a microsecond? And they told me it was a, five, a millionth of a second. Well, I didn't know what a million was. The biggest check I'd ever seen was less than $1,000. I didn't know what a million was. I fussed and fumed. I wanted to know what a microsecond was, and nobody would help me. Pretty soon in the engineering building, they talked about circuits that acted in nanoseconds, billionths of a second. And I did not know what a billion was. And I don't think most of those men up on the hill in Washington do either. <laughs> and if you don't know what a billion is, how on earth do you know what a billionth is? And I fussed and fumed. Finally, one morning, in complete desperation, I called over to the engineering building, and I said, please cut off a nanosecond and send it over to me. <laughs> and what I wanted was a piece of wire which would represent the maximum distance that light or electricity could travel in a billionth of a second. Now, of course, it wouldn't really be through wire. It would be out in space at the velocity of light. So if you start with a velocity of light and use your friendly computer, you discover that a nanosecond is about 11.8 inches long. The maximum distance that light or electricity can travel in a billionth of a second. Boy, I was happy with my nanosecond. I looked at wall switches. Those lights took a couple hundred nanoseconds. I looked at it from all angles. Finally, after about a week, I called back and said, look, I need something to compare this to. Could I please have a microsecond? I can't give you each a microsecond because I've only got one. Here's my microsecond. 984 feet. And I think it'd be a fine idea to hang one over every programmer's desk or maybe around their necks <laughs> so they'll know exactly what they're throwing away when they throw away a microsecond. <laughs> Even if you know all about nanoseconds, I hope you'll get some of these because they're absolutely marvelous for explaining to husbands and wives and children and admirals and generals and people like that. <laughs> And you may get in a spot where you have to explain why two pieces of equipment have to be close together. Or you could land in the spot I did. An admiral wanted to know why it took so damn long to send a message by a satellite. And I had to point out that between here and the satellite, there were a very large number of nanoseconds. <laughs> See, you can really give him the idea of what's happening and make him understand something of what we're up against. So for that reason, I hope you all get some of these nanoseconds. They're wonderful for explaining to people, and the kids just love to take them to school, show and tell. But I said I wanted to add in 300 picoseconds, and of course a picosecond is a thousandth of a nanosecond. The best way to make picoseconds is get one of those big pepper grinders and you make picoseconds all over the table. <laughs> 300 of them are going to be a third of a nanosecond, and there's the problem I'm facing. I no longer have enough distance to get from outside in outside in, add the two together and put the answer back. I'm beginning to push the velocity of light. Dr. Einstein very carefully explained to us when matter attains the velocity of light, matter turns into energy. It goes poof. So what am I going to do? Well, I could use my common sense. Except that seems to be the last thing we ever use in connection with computers. Well, if I won't use common sense, maybe I can use history. 76, we got accustomed to looking at history. Now, back in the early days of this country, when they moved heavy objects around, they didn't have any big tractors. They didn't have any big cranes. They used oxen. And when they got a great big log on the ground and one ox couldn't budge the darn thing, they did not try to grow a bigger ox. <laughs> they, they used two oxen. 
and I think they're trying to tell us something. <laughs> and the answer is that when you need greater computer power, you don't get a bigger computer, you get another computer. And of course, that's what common sense would have told us to begin with. And it should have been recognized long ago, particularly in the area of data processing, because there was never any reason at all for putting inventory and payroll on the same computer. The only reason we did it was because we could only afford to own one computer. And that is no longer true. For the cost of one of those big old mainframes, we can have a whole bunch of microcomputers. And we've got to begin to recognize it, that we will be building systems of computers. The biggest one I've seen so far is the one up at NASA Goddard. That consists of 128 by 128 processors. Each processor can talk to its four neighbors. It's being used to scan the Landsat data to find a change in the color of, of a desert that indicates oil underneath or to track the locust bunch moving and so on. We can build systems of computers. Because one of our major jobs is going to be to explain to our seniors that these little boxes that cost so little are more powerful than the big mainframes we had a few years ago. I can remember when a 64K mainframe was something. Now you can have a 512 micro tomorrow. And we have failed to recognize what's been happening and failed to explain it to our seniors. And we will be building systems of computers. And certainly, for sure, in data processing area, it's absolutely essential that we go in that direction. Of course, for a while, we'll be rescued by the optical computers. They're coming down the pike, hopefully. At least about a year ago, Westinghouse gave Carnegie Mellon a million dollars to build the first op optical computer. We're going to need those for another reason. If an A-bomb was de detonated 250 miles up over the cent center of the country, it would generate an electromagnetic pulse, which would take out all the telephone lines, all the power lines, all the computers, and everything else in the country. Probably the greatest risk we feel we face, and we must have the optical cables and the optical computers as soon as possible. So we'll start to build systems of computers. Well, now the minute you do that, we're going to face another problem. Again, we have this tremendous mass of data to be handled. How are we going to handle all that data and all that information? The answer's here, but it took the darndest long time to get it across. Because it was 1972 that Bell Labs first proposed using a back-end computer to manage the data for a large mainframe, put the database management system on an auxiliary computer. They showed it would go faster and cost less. In 1974, they published a paper, back-end computer for database management. Nobody paid any attention. In 77, the Army Research Group at Georgia Tech actually used a back-end computer to manage the data for a large mainframe and out-and-out -out proved it would go faster and cost less. Still nobody may have paid any attention. And it was not until 1982 that we were able to put our first database machine in the Navy. Since we were under very strict travel money limitations, I suggested they put it as far from Washington as possible. I had to keep more fingers out of it. I suggested Yokosuka or Honolulu. <laughs> they ended up putting it out at Point Magoo, which is as far as you can get west on the continental United States. It went out at the Naval Ordnance Service Center out there, its research center, and it has been highly successful. The second one went in up at Newport. It manages the database for the anti-submarine warfare surveillance, surveillance system. And the third one has gone in Nardak, Washington, where it handles an ordinary data processing installation. Now, a database machine is not a computer. It's a black box full of chips, but it is a relational database. And they're fast. They're fantastically fast. They're data. And they said, hey, all this data belongs to our policyholders. It's personal. It has to be protected. All this data belongs to running our company. We want everybody to use it. Gee, we've got two databases. They put in two database machines, one highly protected and the other open. It gives us a chance of actually protecting classified data with multiple database machines. One of our men at NARDAC wrote a paper, Database Machines, It's About Time. And one of the things he did was to show the possible configurations of multiple computers and multiple databases. 
And this is the direction we must go if we're to get the power which is required for handling the data and the information which will descend upon us in the future. And the sooner we begin to think that way, the sooner we can begin to design those systems. And the sooner we can begin to look at our data, look at our processing, and begin to spread it out. And one of the most important steps there was the database machine is not a computer. We've got to have more of those specialized machines. I'd like to have a file processing machine. I'd like to have a graphics machine, all of which would form part of this system, along with some intelligent PBXs who would look at the data that comes in and decide which micro to send it to. There's a tremendous need for specialized pieces of equipment that do a particular job and that will be dedicated to that job. We'll also build these large systems, which again will be dedicated. The two that the Navy needs now are the weather machine and the oceans machine. Those will run 24 hours a day, seven days a week on those problems. And they should be computers designed for those problems, not general purpose computers that you run on. We don't need those craze. We need specialized machines. They were mad. Look at the whole ocean and the waves and all the other things that happen in the ocean. We need another one for the weather. We've got to begin to think of systems of computers. Each chip may be a computer, but still we've got to find the ways to put them together and solve these major problems. And we don't need special general purpose computers for that. We need specialized computers, just as the one NASA built was built to handle Landsat data. So we've got to begin to think in all these directions, and we need these things very, very badly. Well, I'm trying to, oh, of course, there's one danger in this going ahead and doing things. Um, at any given moment in time, there's always a line out here. That line represents what your boss will believe at that moment in time. Now, of course, if you step over it, you don't get the budget. So you have a double responsibility to that line. Don't step over it. But also keep on educating your boss so you move the line further out. So next time you can go further into the future. I like to show you how easy it is to stand, step over it. Back in 1951, it was becoming increasingly clear, 51, 52, 53, 54, that there were a large number of people who loved symbols. They were scientists and engineers. There were also a large number of people that hated symbols, and they worked in words, and they were the data processors. So we proposed that we would permit people to write in English statements, and we would provide a compiler which would translate to machine code. Because I was promptly told that I couldn't do that because computers couldn't understand English words. A lot of how I never expected any computer to understand anything. All I was going to do was compare bit patterns. But that concept was so alien, nobody would listen. So we went ahead and did it. We built a pilot model of the compiler that would translate English into machine code. And on the end of the report, which is dated January 1955, we put a nice little English language program. And we said, dear kind, wonderful management, if you will come down to the machine room, we will submit this English language program to the computer and we will get out a machine-coded program. And this thing read, input inventory file A, price file B. Compare product number A with product number B. If greater go to operation 10, if equal go to operation 5, otherwise go to operation 2. Transfer A to D, write item D, jump to operation 8. And it ended up rewind B, close out file C and D and stop. You see this was one of the ancestors of the COBOL language. But we looked at it. And we were asking for the biggest budget we'd ever asked for. And we decided that was awful small. So we decided we'd better do something more. We wrote a program that went into the compiler and located all the English words and told us where they were, and we replaced them. We said, dear kind, wonderful management, while you're in the machine room, we'd also like to run this program for you. Donne avatar list our pre list bay. Compare program number R back program number bay. Si superior, allez en apprécier 10. Si égal, allez en apprécier 5. Autrement, allez en apprécier 2. Transfère à un day, écrivez day, sautez en apprécier 8. Ended up en relay bay, terminé le signe de l'arrêté. Love to run this French program for you. Well, if you do something once, it's an accident. If you do it twice, it's a coincidence. 
But if you can do it three times, you've uncovered a natural law. So, of course, we change the words again. I'm rather inventor, fog now, price fog now. All the some beautiful words in this one. Ubertraga as a day, Shriva day, Sprunzu, no doubt, Sprunzu. Ended up where I wanted to be and stopped. Love to run this German program for you. Have you figured out what happened to us? That thing hit the fan. It was absolutely obvious that a respectable American computer built in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, could not understand French or German. And I had to spend the next four months saying, no, 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 we wouldn't think of programming it in anything but English. We had stepped over that doggone line of what management would believe. So you have to be awful careful of that line. So we went to Dr. Saul Gaunt at the University of Pennsylvania and said, hey, call a meeting for us. He did. We were all in agreement what we wanted to do. We asked Penn to consider the meeting, continue the meetings, but they thought it'd get too big for him. So we decided to go to the Department of Defense. We went to Charles Phillips, who was then the controller of the Department of Defense. He called a meeting in Washington, and I've never seen anything like it before or since. So much power in one room. All the manufacturers of computers and all of them biggest users. GE, Westinghouse, Aetna, DuPont, all of them. At the end of the meeting, they were in agreement. They wanted one data processing language. They set up CODASIL, the Conference on Data Systems Languages, and they in turn set up the Programming Language Committee to define the language which came to be known as COBOL. Well, less than a year later, there were rumors all over the industry that COBOL was dead. If it wasn't dead, it was dying. Now, this upset people terribly. Particularly upset Howard Bromberg, the RCA representative. He'd worked awful hard on it. And finally one day he was worrying, driving down the highway worrying about the possible death of COBOL when he happened to drive past a place where they sold gravestones, marble cemetery monuments. And he went in and bought one of the gravestones. It's about this long, this deep, stands about this high, has a carved reclining lamb on the top of it. He got a reduced price because the ears were chipped. <laughs> he had the word COBOL cut in the front of it, and then he shipped it express collect to Mr. Phillips in the Pentagon. <laughs> Someday you want to get the story of what security went through when it appeared. <laughs> Phillips kept it in his office in the Pentagon until he went over to American National Standards Institute, and next month, on the 16th, it'll be donated to the Computer Museum in Boston. That was the turning point. The story got out, the report came back, and that was the turning point in the development of the COBOL language. Now, that's not the best way in the world to make our decisions. We can't count on there being people that send tombstones express collect to the Pentagon. <laughs> there should be a better way of getting together to make decisions as to where we go in the future. Now, of course, we can always go too far on any of these things. I have one paper which I have enjoyed reading ever since the day I first saw it. Wouldn't it be nice if we could write up computer programs in ordinary English, or would it? It's by I.D. Hill of the UK Medical Research Council, and he arrives at a very interesting conclusion. He says, no, we don't want to write computer programs in ordinary English, but it sure would be nice if we could tell people what to do in programming languages. <laughs> now, I'm going to give you just one of his examples. He says, consider the following from a shampoo bottle. For best results, wet hair with warm water. Gently work in the first application. Rinse thoroughly and repeat. He says, repeat from where? <laughs> Surely the rule must be that in the absence of other information, we repeat from the first instruction. But this means we have to wet the hair we've just rinsed. Let's well, use a little common sense and not bother with that. But the next instruction refers to the first application. We cannot do that again, so perhaps logic tells us to miss that one out, too. So the only thing left to repeat is rinse thoroughly and repeat. <laughs> and now we are in a closed loop and must continue rinsing our hair until aborted. <clears throat> he says how much clearer it would be to say, for best results, begin. Wet hair with warm water. For J equals 1, comma 2, do. <laughs> 
immediately worked in application J, who rinsed thoroughly. And of course, that's the Algol program for rinsing your hair. He says, I do not expect to see anything like that on a shampoo bottle within my lifetime. But I think it is something to be desired, far more than desiring to write plain English for computers. So we have to be a little careful sometimes not to go too far. Well, it finally got to be 1966, and I got a letter from the Chief of Naval Personnel, aimed directly at me personally. The first paragraph said, you have completed 23 years in the reserves, which is more than 20. I knew that. <laughs> The second paragraph said, you have attained age 60, and I knew that too. And the third paragraph said, here are the blanks, please apply for retirement. So I did, and I met the saddest day of my life, the 31st of December, 1966. I was officially placed on the Naval Reserve Retired List with the rank of commander. Thanks to our highly automated pension system, I got my first pension check on the 1st of April. Two weeks later, I got a call from the Pentagon, come down to Washington and want to talk to you. So I came a running, as I was due when the Navy sends for me. And I had to wait in Mr. Reams' outer office, and there were two captains there. Being only a commander, I spoke to them very pleasantly and respectfully. But inadvertently, I managed to tell those two men, my aren't the captains young nowadays? And wouldn't you know, one of them turned out to be my new commanding officer, so I started on the right foot. Mr. Ream took one look at me and said, the Navy payroll's been written 823 times. This has got to stop. So naturally, I said, yes, sir. It ended up, he asked me to return to active duty with the job of standardizing the high-level languages and getting the whole Navy to use them. I allowed us how the first half of that job was finite, the second was infinite, but I'd be very glad to make a start on it. And so I reported on the 1st of August, 1967, on six months temporary active duty. And so far, it's the longest six months I ever spent in my life. As for Navy personnel, I gave you one lieutenant, one civilian, two DP-3s, and a secretary. They gave us an office in the fifth deck of the Pentagon. That's the attic. Escalates go to the fourth deck, and you hike to the fifth. We later got promoted to the third basement. If you've never been there, the third basement of the Pentagon is an extremely interesting area. The cockroaches are four inches long, and they're armored. <laughs> We had to keep a two before to hit them with, because you can't squinch them. They gave us each a desk and a chair and a pad and a pencil. No cards, no tapes, no computer, and no budget. Well, since I was starting a new Navy activity, the first thing I did was go out and buy a coffee urn. The second thing I did was teach my new crew the things the chief had taught me during World War II. He was a chief bosun's mate. And I'd like to assure you that our new Navy men and women are just as good as any World War II man ever was. It only took them two weeks to completely furnish the office. Of course, I'd given them the chief's full instructions. He said, if you need something, first you liberate from the Air Force. They have everything. <laughs> if you can't find it there, you liberate from the Army. They have almost everything, and they don't know how to count. <laughs> and there's absolutely no use trying to liberate from the Marines or the Seabees because they liberated it to begin with. It still holds. The only time we nearly got in trouble was the day they turned up with a coffee table like they have down in the secretary's office. The captain took one look at it and said, where'd you get that? But I remembered what the chief had told me to do. I just stood perfectly straight and said, Captain, it wasn't bolted down. <laughs> so that became one of our mottos. If it isn't bolted down, bring it home. And we did so well that eventually one of the junior officers at Navcossack gave us our own flag. It's a beautiful nylon boat flag with grommets and everything. While we were in the Pentagon, it was on a pole beside my desk, and it was a skull and crossbones. <laughs> and to the best of my knowledge, we were the only office ever in the entire Pentagon that openly flew the Jolly Roger. <laughs> Our first problem was computer time, no money. We lived on the slack. Now, slack is something that McNamara and his systems analysts and MBAs never understood. It's a little bit of give that has to be in anything that operates. He tried to count every piece of ammunition sent to Vietnam. We forgot about ships that go down and see in thievery in the Saigon docks, and we ran short. We had to fly ammunition because there was no give in the system. If you have two pieces of metal that are roll on each other, if you machine those to fit perfectly, they'll freeze and never move again. That's the way metal behaves. If you machine them so there's a little space between, fill it with grease and oil, everything will go beautifully. That's slack. It has to be in there. No good chief operator will ever schedule a single computer 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
He leaves five minutes here and ten minutes there for the things that happen when you run computers. My crew made friends with every chief operator in the Pentagon. They'd call us and say, can you use five minutes? Can you use ten minutes? And we'd go run that computer. That meant our programs had to run on anybody's computer, and of course everybody in the Pentagon knew you couldn't do that. DP3 Bear didn't know that. He wrote a program in low-level COBOL that asks you which computer you're on. You can answer anything from Mandel to Apple to back again. And as it pulls the remainder of the program in, it inserts the control cards and special names, and you run that computer. And you can write programs that'll run on anybody's computer, and the entire sets of test routines are so written. Well, two and a half years later, we had a set of programs that would tell us whether or not a COBOL compiler did, in fact, meet and fully implement the American National Institute standard. So I was invited to give a presentation for the Secretary of the Navy. I'm the Secretary, Under Secretary, Assistant Secretary, Chief Naval Operations, all the Vice Admirals. They rehearsed me for two weeks ahead of time. I went through one dry run after another till I was letter perfect. We finally got to the great and wonderful morning, and I was walking down the executive corridor beside the captain. He looks down at me and says, first time a woman ever gave a presentation in that room. That was so I'd feel more at ease, more comfortable. <laughs> he let me get about 10 feet further. He says, first time anybody below the rank of captain ever gave a presentation in that room. He had me in good shape by the time I got there. <laughs> so the first thing I did was break from the speech and tell the secretary, it's just as well, we hadn't had a budget. Because if we had had one, I'd still be filling out the papers to get our first hour of computer time. But I got through to the end, and he was a charming gentleman. He thanked me. He congratulated me. And then he said, is there anything we can do to help you? Now, I hadn't been briefed on how to answer that question, so I waded right in. I said, yes, I wanted two more DPs and $20,000 to survey the users of COBOL to find out what they needed next. And that whole room collapsed in one roar of laughter, and he said he'd see what he could do about it, and I got out the door. I looked at the captain and said, well, what did I do this time? He said, don't you realize nobody ever asked for less than 20 million in that room before? <laughs> we got the 20,000 and two more DPs. <laughs> Only to run full tilt into an extremely serious problem in the Pentagon. We found there was a very large number of civilians and even some officers who were not about to listen to a young man or woman who wore a sailor suit even though they were trained experts. It got so bad, the captain finally said, we will have to take them out of uniform. I don't think I ever regretted anything more than the day I told those youngsters, take off your uniform so that people will listen to you. I tried to make up for it. I paid for having cards printed for each one of them, Navy SEAL in the corner, and I made them all managers, Mr. George N. Baird, manager of test and evaluation. That had a wonderful effect on the civilians. They're scared to death of managers. <laughs> I find we have a very bad habit of underestimating our young people in this country today. And I think it's the fault of the media, TV, radio, newspapers. They tell us only about the 20% that are no good. They completely fail to tell us about the 80% that are the brightest, the healthiest, the most eager to learn we've ever had. And I've seen them in the schools and colleges and coming into the Navy all across the country. I watched a third grade class in Independence, Missouri. They were writing programs in BASIC and debugging them as a matter of course, having a perfectly wonderful time. And of course I know our young people are healthier than they used to be, because they've had vitamin pills all their lives long, and I had to eat tablespoons full of emulsified cod liver oil. <laughs> They're out there, the brightest youngsters we've ever had. Now I grant you, they are not coming from the two coasts or the big cities. They're coming from North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, northern New England. They're coming from Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, from southern Indiana, southern Illinois, southern Ohio, northern Georgia, northern Alabama. They're coming from Iowa, from Nebraska, from West Texas. They're coming from all those parts of the country where people still believe you have to work to earn something and work to learn something. And I find those young people are looking for something. And the thing that they're looking for is that positive leadership. I don't know where we lost it. We went overboard at the end of World War II for management. Everything could be done by management. We listened to McNamara, the systems analysts, the MBAs, and we forgot about leadership. And I mean it in that old sense, two-way street, loyalty up and loyalty down. Respect for your superior, keep him informed, make suggestions. Superior, take care of your crew. 
For instance, in my case, I decided every one of those youngsters should be able to get on their feet and give a report and not say, you know. So I put a little square box on the desk with a slot in, but they said, you know, during the report, they had to put a quarter in. We didn't take the quarters, but it tied up their capital. <laughs> You'd be surprised how fast they learned not to say, you know. When they did, there was a reward. When I was invited to give a presentation for an admiral, I would arrive with my entire team, team trailing after me. Then one by one, I would introduce them to give the report on their part of the work. And I swear I watched those youngsters grow two inches when an admiral said, well done. That's something we forget. Give praise when praise is due. We ball people out all the time. How often do we say, well done, that was a good job, thank you. That's part of leadership as well. And our young people are looking for it. One outfit never lost it. That was the Marines. And I think if I had a Marine standing beside me, what he would say would be, when the going gets rough, you cannot manage a man into combat. You must lead him. And he would add, you manage things. You lead people. We need that again. Not alone in the armed forces. We needed government, and we needed an industry. We need it all across the country. And our young people are looking for it. Well, eventually, our programs were accepted. And the order went out which said all compilers brought into the inventory of the Department of Defense should be tested. You Navy shall form a compiler testing service. That was fine, but it left out the rest of the federal government. So the National Bureau of Standards came and got a copy of our programs. We were glad to share them until two weeks later, and then was I mad. Our test routines had been printing out at the top of every report, U.S. Navy compiler test. And I found them loose in Washington. They were printing out NBS compiler test. Boy, was I mad. They came around to one new set of the programs, and I said I wasn't going to give them one. I was promptly told that politically I must cooperate with the National Bureau of Standards. So I thought about it for two whole days. And then I handed them a new tape, and as I handed it to them, I promised them if they again attempted to change NB U.S. Navy into NBS, it would blow their operating system off their computer. <laughs> Eventually, we held a peace conference and exchanged our prisoners of war, and the National Bureau of Standards delegated to the Navy the job of testing all compilers for the federal government. I continued a little around th three years ago. At that time, the Appropriations Committee of the House of Representatives made an absolutely horrifying discovery. They discovered that the Navy was performing a federal function. In their total and complete horror of such a thing, they picked the compiler testing service out of the Navy, changed most of our Navy people into civilians, and transferred it to the G General Services Administration. Fortunately, they're still doing a good job. Six times a year, this report comes out, certified compiler list. It lists all the compilers for basic, Fortran, COBOL, and ADA, which have been tested and found to meet the standards. And it's an awful nice thing when you buy a compiler to know that the darn thing has been certified and that you know it's going to work properly. I'm tremendously proud of what those youngsters have accomplished over these years. Two have received the Navy Achievement Award for starting the test routines. One second-class petty officer led a group of four. One second-class, two third-class, and a seaman. They wrote a COBOL compiler for an 8K machine when everybody said it couldn't be done. She received the Achievement Award. For myself, I've probably spent the most exciting, interesting, challenging, busy 18 years I've ever spent in my life, and I've loved every minute of it. I've also received most of the awards that are given to anyone in the computer industry. Each time I've received one, I've thanked them. Then I've told them something I'd like to repeat to you. I've already received the highest award I will ever receive, no matter how long I live, no matter how many more jobs I may have. And that has been the privilege and the responsibility of serving very proudly in the United States Navy. Now, I hope you'll all get nanoseconds. Anybody got a question or did I snow you totally? <laughs> There's one way back there. ADA was designed for signal processing. For signal processing, I think it's tops. We needed it to replace Jovial. For data processing, it's absolutely lousy. As long as it's used for the embedded weapon systems, the computers embedded in weapon systems, fine. If they try to extend it to data processing, it'll kill it. Does that answer it? Yes? 
Given that we're moving into the information age and actually have been there for some time, how do you perceive the, the, the uh, so-called threat of the Japanese? They're moving ahead, but they have one difficulty. And there was one article in um, American Scientist, the, the um, Sigma Psi publication, that pointed it out. Theirs is a picture language. When they look at something, they sense a series of pictures. That's totally different from our language, which is this does this to this. If you notice, they're not writing software. They're not designing processors. They're building the memory chips. They're buying our processor chips. Their major difficulty is going to be their language, probably. I've only seen that one article, but I think it was worth looking at, that the contrast of the language is inhibiting them. Are they learning English? Yes, they're very carefully sending all our young people to Northern Europe and this country to learn our directed languages. But it's a very serious problem. All the picture languages. Of course, it may be that that'll get them somewhere on AI. Supposedly, it's easier to do uh, speech recognition with Japanese than English. Yeah. After you've got, you know what it means. There's something else in recognition that I'll tell you one small, one more small story. Back in 1951, we all had sections of code in our notebooks, you know, for a sine or a cosine, arc tangent, that had been checked out. We knew they worked and so on. And so, if I needed a sine routine to eight digits, I'd crawl across the deck and say, "Can I have your sine routine?" I'd copy it into the new program. In order to do that, I had to copy it and I had to add to all the addresses. And I very quickly discovered that programmers can't copy things and they can't add. Because uh, spaces turned into fours and Bs turned into thirteens and all sorts of things happen. And there's that, that beautiful big gadget lets have it copy those segments of code and make a new program. And that's where the first compiler started from. I was working on Univac 1. I only had a thousand words of storage. And I was coming along with Operation 20, Operation 21, and Operation 22 turned out to be a test. One side of it went in orderly fashion to Operation 23, but the other side of it wanted to go to Operation 43. Now I was pulling each one of these in, processing it, and putting it out again. It was a single pass compiler. And I didn't know where this was going to be because I hadn't gotten there yet, and I thought I was stalled on building a compiler. And all of a sudden, after about a week and a half of stewing over this, I remembered playing basketball. Now, in those days, the women's basketball court was divided in half. The forwards were up by the basket. The guards were here and couldn't cross the board. But the center and side center could, and I was a side center. Now, I might get the ball down here. Now, I obviously couldn't get it in the basket. So I'd look around for one of my teammates, send the ball over to her, run like hell up under the basket and she'd throw me the ball and I'd put it in. And I realized that what I needed was a forward pass. So I set aside a small area of storage and I put a jump down to here and in here I put 43. Then I had each of these operations look to see if its number was down here. And when I got to operation 43 and found the 43 here, I put another jump there up to here. That was the forward pass of the basketball game. Now, there's something there that we don't seem to know how to do. What I, when I thought about it, I realized the structure of those two problems is identical. And I decided what I had was some kind of a wobbly geometry. The ends may be fixed, but the stuff in between can mump. And in fact, I decided I'd use block and tackle to describe it after looking at the Constitution. There's something there that my mind, stewing over this, remembered playing basketball because the configurations were identical. Now, if I could only make a file of those configurations and match a new problem to the configurations, I could solve problems. But how in the devil did I do it? Somehow, I saw that the configurations were identical. We should be able to describe those configurations and then match new problems to them. And the geometry may be quite wobbly. So there's another area we've got to think about, if you want to know how the mind does things. Yes? What do you think about the uh, current popularity of artificial intelligence and the new technique on the horizon? 
Well, all of it I don't quite go along with, but I sure need some of those routines that'll analyze the data and help that guy commanding the ship to make use of all the information he's got. The guy that's managing supply needs it badly. We're throwing tons of information at him without giving him any way to get through it. We need those expert routines. And we need to remind him of what he might forget, too. I know, there's lots of work on vision, touch, voice, all that, but I need those expert routines first, and very badly. And I need this kind of thing for solving problems. We're only at the beginning. We're just getting started. Thank you very much for being good listeners. Don't forget to get some more. Don't forget those youngsters, they need that leadership.